quiet silence of a heart that believes itself defeated by loss, by pain, by fear. Our hope nailed to a cross, our own faith depleted at the sight of no movement, a body inert. But it is not the end. At the sound of the gravestone rolling, a new story has unfolded. Death has been defeated. Our hope is alive. Jesus is alive. We raise our hands in victory. By his resurrection, we are set free. He blows a wind of life and brings us back to the light. He is risen. Our Messiah is alive. He breathes and the darkness trembles. He speaks and our future shines. By his sacrifice, we are now saved. By his grace, we can all rise. Here rejoicing in the sky, the grave could not hold him. The veil has been torn. Our Christ has won over death, over sin, over ache. By his power, all chains break. He is victorious. He is the way. He is the resurrection and the life. And by his wounds, we're made alive. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the blows of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. And you have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, oh sing it again, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord, our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God. Oh yeah. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. We're so glad that you joined us here at Allison Park Church. Come on, we're going to celebrate our risen Savior. So let's clap our hands together like this. Let's sing this. There's a place. There's a place where my hope is found. I will come lay my burdens down. I will remember. I will remember the cross. Every day is a battleground, but the war is already won. I will remember, I will remember the cross. I will remember, I will remember the cross. Come on, every voice, sing it out. The battle is yours. It's so 
is free indeed Oh, there's no more chains on me Even the sun sets free is free indeed Oh, we thank you, Jesus Even the sun sets free is free indeed
everybody, and happy Resurrection Sunday. It's great to have you with us. And uh, we're going to sing one more song together in just a sec, but um, just want to pause to quickly say we are really glad you're here and celebrating um, the greatest event in all of history. This event represents hope. We believe that when Jesus rose from the dead, this is more than a story. This means hope for us for the rest of our life. This is what our hope is rooted in. Um, and so as we get ready to sing one more song, I just want to say, if you're visiting with us, if you're newer here, we would love if you say, I want to invite you to, to worship and sing with us. We don't want to pressure you into anything, but you know, we believe what we're singing, that Jesus is alive. Anybody believe that in this place? That's what we're celebrating. So we're going to sing a real easy song. And as we get ready to sing this now, let's, let's remember who Jesus is. Lord, we believe that you're more than just an event. You're more than a story. We believe you are alive today. And so we worship you. You are the center of our lives. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, you are my hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could find?
the idea of crisis first. So I mentioned this a couple weeks ago that psychologists today have said that we may go through up to eight crises in our life journey. What kind of crisis is okay? We tend to think the most famous one is the midlife crisis. It's when you turn about 40 and you start to ask the question, I didn't think life was supposed to feel like this. Maybe I did it wrong. And so some people having a midlife crisis go back to do things that they're just not you know, the age four. They try to be 18 again and redo their life. And so that's one thing that happens, midlife crisis. But good news for those of you who are 25, you don't have to wait till you're 40 to have a crisis. They have one built for you. It's called quarter life crisis. How many of you heard of that before? Quarter life is when you ask, have I already gotten it wrong? Have I gotten the wrong degree? Am I in the wrong job? Do I want to have any kids? Am I going to be a good parent? All kinds of questions in the quarter life era. And then there is sort of the late in life crisis when you get ready to retire but you're healthy enough and you start to say what do I want to do with the rest of my life you know I think of Carl Hendrickson in the movie up and he still has a dream and healthy enough to do something late in life crisis so good news is let me just tell you no matter where you are in your life's journey there is a crisis awaiting you how about that yes in fact you don't have to wait to enjoy yours now in fact maybe you should just tell the neighbor that you're sitting with say see that's what it is with you you're in a crisis just tell him right now I knew there was something right that's my problem too right we're all in some kind of a journey in life now we're going to talk in a minute something called post post life crisis but let me take you to one other moment and that's what we'll call end of life crisis now not everybody has the opportunity to have this because sometimes death comes surprisingly but when you know it's going to happen there's a lot of questions that come with that too and I remember when I was 19 years old one of the most one of the first significant people in my life to pass was my grandpa Campanella and so Grandpa Campanella died. He was diagnosed with cancer, and I had some minutes with him ahead of that moment when he passed. So let me just paint a picture for you. My grandpa, an Italian immigrant, Erie, Pennsylvania, five foot four, not very verbal. He was a very serious, very loving man, but not very verbal at all. And when he talked, it tended to be in a whisper, right? He wasn't the godfather but he talked like him a little bit, okay? So he would start his prayer like this. By the time he was done, he had whispered, okay? So I was sitting with Grandpa Campanella. Uh, What had happened is they diagnosed him with cancer. He had a tumor pressing on his spine. They told him if he didn't have it removed that he would probably be paralyzed. So he had the tumor removed and to, to stabilize his spine, they put him in a halo. Have you seen one of those where they bolt your head in and you know, you've got this apparatus on you so that you can't turn your neck? And so here he is laying in the bed. Now they've told him he's only got a few days to live. And I have a chance to sit, to sit next to him. And the first thing he said to me, one-on-one, he said, he said Jeff, I, I, I know you're going into the ministry. And he said, I want you to know that you need to, in ministry, remember those who are suffering. Because he said, I, I never understood how people go through things until the last few months. And now that I have suffered through this, I wish I could go back and be more sensitive to the people who are suffering in the world. And after we talked about that for a little bit, I said, but Grandpa, you're gonna go to heaven. I mean, you're excited about that, right? You've followed Jesus your whole life. Are you excited to go to heaven? And and he said this, I'll never forget this statement. He said, said, everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to have to die to get there. 
Isn't that the truth? Because death is a mystery. We don't know what's going to happen, what it will be like, what will happen after. Is it what they said it would be? How can anybody know? This is the post-life crisis. One day we're going to open our eyes on the other side and we're going to find out what's there. And that's what this series is about. We want to talk about some issues regarding what happens after we die and all the misconceptions that sometimes have come with the idea of heaven and hell and the afterlife. And today we're going to talk about, first of all, the hope of the resurrection. But some of you might be thinking this, Pastor Jeff, you're bumming me out, man. I mean, here we are on Easter Sunday and you're talking about death, your story about your grandpa and now I'm feeling sad. Like, aren't we supposed to be shouting and celebrate he is risen? Okay, we're gonna get there, but I want you to understand that Easter celebration only has meaning in the context of this question. And by the way, it's actually very wise to think about these things. Let me just tell you, Psalm 90, Moses wrote this Psalm, verse 12, teach us to number our days, it says, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. When you realize that your life is short and you are mortal and there is an eternity that awaits you, it just helps you live a wiser life. So I'm helping you out today, right? Helping you be a little wiser today. Okay, here's the second verse I'll introduce to you. Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes this, chapter seven, verse two. It is better to go into the house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. And then it says, and the living should take this to heart. So actually considering the fact that there is Death coming makes us wiser, makes us think better about things. And built into the framework of this celebration of Easter, Christianity over hundreds of years has a pattern. Now, I don't come from a tradition personally uh, where we celebrated all of the aspects of Lent. How many of you come from a tradition where you celebrated Lent or still do? Okay, yeah, look at that. Okay, a lot of people did. So I first learned about this when I was in elementary school and I had some friends of mine that showed up in February on a Wednesday and they had some stuff on their forehead. And I asked them the question, what's on your forehead? And they said, oh, it's ashes. And I said, what, why do you have ashes on your forehead? In the shape of a cross. And they're like, because it's Ash Wednesday. And I said, oh, great. Well, what's Ash Wednesday? And they said, well, it's the day we go to church to get ashes put on our forehead. And I was like, I totally get that, but why? And they were like, I don't know, because a lot of times we go through religious rituals and we don't know why we do what we do. Isn't it true? I have since come to understand the power of Ash Wednesday. Do you know what this means? When you put ashes on your forehead, you're saying, one day I'm gonna die. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I'm reminded that I'm mortal and one day I'm gonna die and I'm going to point myself towards Easter. So Ash Wednesday starts a 40-day journey towards Resurrection Day to say, one day I'm going to die, but I have hope in the fact that even though I'm going to die, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and because he lives, I too one day will live. Isn't that an awesome reminder of what the whole thing is about? So the celebration of the resurrection only has meaning in the context of this question of what happens to us when we die. And there is a certainty, a hope that comes with the resurrection that we're celebrating today. So let's get into the good parts now. Here's what Luke chapter 24 tells us. Little context now, Luke is a journalist. He actually was a doctor, but he isn't a firsthand observer of the resurrection or the life of Jesus. He actually interviewed all the firsthand eyewitnesses to see what they had heard and seen. And he docs, documents it in his book called Luke and then writes another one called Acts in the New Testament. And here's what it says, Luke chapter 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Remember, Jesus crucified on Friday, died for our sins. They took him down from the cross. They buried him in the tomb. They put a, a stone on the outside of it. They sealed it with the Roman seal and guarded it with guards because rumor had it that Jesus was going to come back from the dead. This was what he had predicted. And the women that went there found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. That's code for angels, right, that are there. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, now here's what we're going to do. Often, traditionally, churches do this on an Easter Sunday. They read in unison these words from Luke 24. So let's start here with the word why. Read it with me. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you 
while he was still with you in Galilee. Okay, let's just, let's start again with this one and let's read it boldly. Say it with me. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you when he was still with you. Yeah, give somebody a high five and say, that's good news right there. Okay, this is what we're celebrating. He is not here. He is risen from the dead. Okay, now here's what we're gonna say to you today. So we're going to do this three-part series, Post-Life Crisis, and we're talking about what happens after death. And I know, you know there's a couple times we think about this. We think about this when someone prominent in our life passes and we wonder what's happening to them now. We think about it like what was happening in COVID-19 era where people were dying and we were wondering what will happen to me if, that would, if I would get sick like this. Or sometimes, like when I was a little boy and I learned about death, I often would lay awake at night wondering what the future would be like and what death was. Maybe you're not neurotic like I was, but a lot of people think about these things. So we're gonna ask this question and we're gonna talk about this in three parts. The hope that comes from the resurrection. And then we're gonna talk about what the Bible says about hell and what the Bible actually says about heaven because there's a lot of misconceptions and bad teaching around these topics and we're gonna try to circle back to give you some good perspectives in this three-part series. What we wanna say to you today is this. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, the day that I die can be the best day of my life. Okay, you don't have to fear death if you have confidence and hope in Christ. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, the day that I die can be the best day of my life. Now, let's talk about some implications that come from the fact that Jesus is alive. The first thing it implies to us is that death is not an ending. It's actually a beginning. Because Jesus rose, it says there's something more. Now, probably all of us have rooted inside of us this sense that life is more than just here and now, that, that I'm built for more, that my heart cries out for something more. At least we hope that there is something more, right? But who can ever prove that to us? Because technically, in order to have scientific proof, you have to have someone that's gone and come back. And you say, yeah, but Pastor Jeff, I've heard stories, right, of people who died and they were on the table and they got the paddles out and they brought them back and they were out for like 10 minutes and they said, when I was out, I saw a light and I started moving to the light. Or maybe you read that book. There was a movie made about a little boy who died and he had this you know, experience in heaven and then he came back and you're like, or maybe some of you are like, no, I don't even believe that because I knew someone who, who died and they said they saw nothing at all. So who can really know if any of those things are valid or what is said in the little video we watched where they said, you know, you just die. It's over, right? There's nothing at all. I mean, so, so how do we know what happens after we die? This is the question. Now, I just want to say all of those people who died and came back were actually something we call resuscitated. They weren't actually resurrected. Even the guy that we've talked about the last couple of weekends, his name was Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus was dead for four days, and in the tomb, and Jesus said, roll away the stone, John chapter 11, Lazarus come forth. Lazarus actually wasn't resurrected. He was actually resuscitated. And why is that important? Well, because you see, Lazarus breathed a few more breaths, a few more days and weeks and years, and then he died again. What makes Jesus different from Lazarus's coming back is that Jesus rose in a new form to conquer death and he never died again. You see, Jesus not only rose from the grave, he's alive today and he sets a pattern of hope for us that one day when we rise, we too will rise for all of eternity. And, and so now here we have this concept does Jesus prove to us that there is something beyond the grave? Let's ask this question. Now, some of you who might be skeptical, but you might say, well, how can we know Jesus really did come back from the dead? And this is not just a religious myth. Okay, well, first of all, there was no body in the tomb. There would be one way to have ended the movement of Christianity at the very inception, and that is to have produced the dead body of Jesus. Because Christianity is not just a comp compilation of teachings about love. It has one central tenet to that, and that is Jesus is the Son of God, and he proved it because when he died on the cross, he didn't stay dead. He came back from the grave, and he's alive today. You disprove that, all of Christianity goes away. So listen, you say, well, maybe the disciples came up with a scheme to sneak into the tomb and pass the Roman soldiers guarding it and broke open the seal and figured a way to get the body out of there. And, you know, they started this sort of false religion out of this hoax of resurrection from the dead. Well, it's interesting to note that 10 of the 11 disciples who were remaining actually were killed for their faith in Christ. 
So, I mean, if it was a hoax, they were faking it, and then they, they are ready to cut their head off or stab them through, which some experienced, or crucify them upside down like happened to Simon Peter. And they said, deny the resurrection of Jesus and we'll let you go. If you die anyway, very few people are willing to die a cruel death for something that's a hoax. So the martyrs are proof, not just the 10 disciples who were martyred, but the thousands of others who died for faith in Jesus Christ. That has to speak to us. How about this? You know, there are over 2 billion people who follow Jesus today. And people who can say, what happened in your life? Well, I was on a downward trajectory and then I called on the name of the risen Jesus and since then he set me free from drugs or he has delivered me from depression or he helped me have a new start. He brought our marriage back together. Have you heard stories like this? How, how can it be that people call on the name of, of Jesus who, who is still dead and there be transformation? You see millions upon millions of people over centuries whose lives have been changed because of the risen Jesus. It, this, this happens for me very personally, and I know I've told this story many times, but my own dad, when he was nine years old, had rheumatic fever, and he was confined to a bed. They told him if he would ever exert himself, he would probably be in danger of dying because his heart would give out. And they didn't know what to do for him, and he was in a lot of pain, and he, he was asking his mom, what should I do? I feel so much pain. And she said, they were new Christians. She said, I can't do anything for you, but why don't you call in the name of Jesus? So my dad, nine years old, laying in his bed, starts to cry out, Jesus, if you can heal me, Jesus, heal me. And as he was crawling out on the name of Jesus, he fell into a deep sleep. When he woke up to get the door, he ran to the door, had no pain. When they checked him out, he was completely cured. Isn't that awesome? When he was 65 years old, he went and got his heart checked as he was retiring. And he said, please look in to see if there was any evidence that I had a heart problem when I was young. And they said, your heart's great. There's no scar tissue. There's no damage. Because you see, when God does his work, he does it good. Isn't that right? How could it be that he calls on the name of Jesus if Jesus is still dead and experiences healing? You see, the resurrection of Jesus is proof of something, and that is that there is something more to this life than just what we're experiencing now. That life, death is not an ending. It's actually the beginning of something. And now, now I'm going to tell you a little story here. I think that this is probably mostly legend, but it has some roots in history. And I, I'm going to tell it anyway because it has good, a good point to it, all right? So in 1961 when the Soviet Union sent the first astronaut into space. Yuri Gurganin was his name. When he came back, they remember the Soviet Union was atheistic and they wanted to prove that there was no God. So they said, when you were in space, did you see God? And he said, no, I didn't. And so they kind of hyped that up, that there is no God. Science has proved there is no God. So when the United States sent their astronaut into space and they came back, they asked one of the U.S. astronauts, did you see God when you were in space? And he said, no, I didn't. But if I had stepped out of my spacesuit, I would have. <laughs> because we know that while you can't see and prove God here, there is a moment after this life when we expect to meet him. Right? He created us for something more and stamped his image upon us. And so we are looking forward to what's next. Okay, back into Luke 24. Here's what it says again. When they, the women, came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11. Remember, Judas was one of the 12, and he had betrayed Jesus and committed suicide. And they told all these things to the 11, to the others. And it, it was, again, these women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, by the way, a little shout out to the fact that women were the first to see Jesus alive. Come on, isn't that awesome? Love that. And, and so they told the others who were with them and, and told this to the disciples. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Now, this journalist, right, this, this doctor-trained Luke said the disciples were as surprised as anybody that Jesus was alive. And so Peter sprints to the tomb and bending over, he sees the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened when he saw that Jesus was risen from the dead. Now, I love this. I'm gonna just tell you, they, they got to the tomb. There was no body. The tomb was empty, but technically it wasn't completely empty. I heard Stephen Furtick say this recently. I love this. He said, there was something left in the tomb, if you remember. What was left there was the linens, linens that had wrapped his dead body. And here's what he said. What was left was the residue of death. 
It was all that represents what was that held us back before. And so then he preached like this. He said, look, what's still in the tomb is your past. It's your sin. It's your sickness. It's your depression. It's your distance from God. But when Jesus Christ raised from the grave, he left that all behind and he came out to give us a chance at new life. Isn't that good? Come on. Yes. I love also one of the other gospels says that he left the linen's home the, there in the tomb folded. In that, can you picture this now? Jesus is alive and he's like, before I go, <laughs> let me just give him a little clue that, that this wasn't just a robbery here. They just robbed the body. So he folds it over neatly. Someone also said that people in that era, when they would fold their napkin, it was like, have you ever been to those steakhouses? You know, where they give you this deal to say more meat, you have it on one side. Anybody been there, right? Okay, so it's like, when they, if you were to leave your folded napkin, it was to say, I'm coming back. So think, I'm gonna eat some more. So Jesus folded the napkin over to say, I'll be back. Right, I'm risen from the dead and I'm coming back. I love that thought. Okay, since Jesus is alive, death is not an ending, it's a beginning. Here's the second, and that's this. For those who follow Christ, Life after death will look like Jesus. Now, one of the things we're going to cover in this series is the misconceptions regarding heaven. Do you know there's a lot of bad teaching about heaven? And a lot of people believe a lot of things that just aren't true. One of the things people believe about heaven is that it's boring. In fact, I think it got reinforced because, reinforced because sometimes preachers like me get up and say things like this. You know, this is just a great worship service, isn't it? And it's good to know that Jesus is worthy and that you, and when we get to heaven, we'll be worshiping just like this, but not for a few days. We'll be worshiping God for millions and millions of years. And as an eight-year-old boy, I heard that and I thought to myself, heaven is a long church service? Oh no, I don't wanna go to that. I mean, I like church as much as the next guy, but not for millions of years. Wow, that's crazy. So again, we have this, this perception, and we're oftentimes confused about what heaven will look like. I, I saw this far side cartoon from years ago that represents this. Here's the guy sitting on the cloud, and he says, wish I brought a magazine. This is just, am I just a ghost? Am I, am I playing a harp on a cloud in a really bad outfit? I mean, what, what does heaven look? Am I in an eternal church service? In fact, a lot of people, because of these misperceptions about heaven, I remember friends in high school, they'd be like, I don't want to go to heaven with all those religious people. I'm going to go to hell and party with my friends. And I'm like, I don't think that's what hell is either, right? So again, we have all of these things in our mind about what the afterlife is and some way more severe than they, they need to be and others way not severe enough, right? Like we're not somehow caught in the whole mix of it all. And so let me just give you a little tease about what the Bible says heaven will be like. Maybe let's just narrow down what God says about what you will be like. Because a lot of times when you lose a loved one, people will come to me and say, so what's grandma experiencing now? You know, when I see her, will I know her? Will she know me? Is, is she just sort of a ghost, a mist? I mean, what's happening? And, and listen, here's what the way Jesus was raised is the way you will look when you are raised. Um, let me give you scriptures for this now. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Fallen asleep, that means those who've died. First fruits, this was a celebration where they took the beginnings of whatever harvest they had and they would wave it before the Lord in Thanksgiving and they would say, just like we got this beginnings of the wheat harvest, more wheat is to come. Jesus is the first one to be resurrected and he is the beginnings of, now there's a lot more to come. And then it goes on to say, verse 22, same chapter, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ, all will be made alive. So we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, and we all have the physical nature that they have. And just like in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. Verse 47, same chapter. The first man, Adam, was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those of the earth. That's us now. And then it says, and as is the heavenly man, also are all those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, Adam and Eve, so shall we bear, bear the image of the heavenly man. You're gonna look like Jesus. How about that? Now, what was Jesus like then when resurrected? Well, 
The Bible says he was flesh and bone. He was solid. He says to one of the women, don't hold on to me. I haven't yet gone to my father. So he had a physical body. He laughed. He walked around. He was known. He cooked breakfast for the disciples. He ate food. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house? Look, there was a lot of things he did that were just like what we do now. In fact, he blended in. The rest of Luke 24, you can read it later today. He's walking along with the people. Two guys go into the, to Emmaus, and he's on the road. They don't even recognize it's him at first because he looked like just a human being. But listen, different. Not any longer that body carrying the curse of sin upon it. No more sickness. No more bacteria, no more infections, right? No more calories. Come on now. Look, no more death. Look, there's your body now is recreated in the way that God designed it to be. But you're going to be you. You look, you're going to be you. It's not you're going to be a ghost floating around. No, the best day you've ever had on earth, multiply that times a thousand, and that will be heaven. Okay, not, not boring, not. Maybe there's church services, I don't know, but not eternal ones, right? It, it, it will be, it'll be love and joy and laughter. It, it, this is what we're looking forward to. And the resurrection today of Easter tells us what our future will look like. Okay, last point now, and that's this. While everyone dies, while everyone is going to die, we know that's, that's the destiny of all of us. We do not all experience the same post-life result. Now, this is the sobering part of the series and we're going to talk about some of the things the Bible says regarding both heaven and hell in the next couple of weeks. But um, I want to just take you into at least the core behind the meaning of this in some words from Jesus. Some of the most famous words Jesus ever said. He said in, in, in the book of John, chapter 3, it's recorded for us as he was talking to Nicodemus. He said, for God so loved the world, you know this verse, right, that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him, that's the condition, whoever believes in him, it says whoever, that means anybody, right? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have, okay, that word's important, present tense right now, have eternal life. So Jesus says, if you put your trust in me, what I'm coming to do is to give you the opportunity to have life that's in, indestructible that you gain right here, right now, so that then when you die because life is already in you, you will continue to live. Okay, that's what's the meaning of verse 16. And then Jesus goes on to teach. Listen to this now. This is important. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Let me just say, it is never the intent of God for anyone to go to hell, for anyone to be separated from God for all eternity. Jesus didn't come on a mission to pick some to go and some to be left out. No, no, no. That, that is not the will of God. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Okay, here's what it basically teaches us. We live in a world that's cursed with evil. It's messed up everywhere you look. We see hell on earth every day. And we understand that this world under this curse is headed towards destruction. And Jesus came into the world to rescue us, to pluck us off of this, and to bring us into a place of salvation and life. He, he, he's not condemning anybody. He's trying to save everyone. And that's the whole purpose of the coming of Christ into the world. Now, we'll talk about that in some detail next week. But I think we've come to this place in the message where we have to say, okay, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. One of the reasons why you should believe in Jesus is because it settles the question of life after death. Yes. But you don't have to wait until then to receive life right now. In fact, that empty space inside can be ignited and that distance you feel from God can be removed and intimacy can be birthed there. Joy and peace and God starts to change you by his spirit from the inside out. And that life is imparted to you today, which then continues on after death, but it all starts right now. So can we just turn our faces toward heaven, close your eyes right now, wherever you are. I wanna invite you, if you're here today and you're not sure if you're right with God through Jesus Christ, I wanna give you a chance to do what that verse says, whosoever believes in him. And if you're here today and you're away from God and today on this Easter day, you wanna come back to him. Or if you just simply say, Jesus, I want you to be the center of my life. Here's what we're gonna do. 
I'm going to count to three. That number three will be sort of a trigger for you to make the decision of faith. Now, whosoever believes in him, it says, okay, here's what we, we want to do. We want to do more than just think good thoughts toward God. We want to make the choice to say, Jesus, I trust you today. I trust you with my soul. I trust you with my life. I trust you to forgive me, to give me a fresh start. So I'm gonna count to three. And if you wanna come back to God or for the first time, put your faith in Christ. If you're watching online, listen, you can do this right where you are. I'm gonna count to that, that number three. Number three, you throw your hand in the air if that's you. And that'll be your for, first choice of faith. Okay, get your hand ready on the number three. Okay, one, two, Three, just shoot your hand up. Say, that's me today. Yeah, keep it up. Stretch out toward heaven right now. And I'm gonna ask everybody who's willing to pray out loud with me. Let's pray this prayer of faith together. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you are the son of God and you came to this world to rescue me, to save me. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my past sin. I ask you to forgive me now. Cleanse my life. Make me right with God. And I believe that you can save me now and give me eternal life. So I invite you into my life. I believe you're risen from the dead. Give me a fresh start today as I choose to follow you. I trust you now with my soul in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can we give it up for those that pray that today? Beautiful. All right. Well, we're glad you're here on this Easter day. Why don't we all stand up together? And uh, let me just say, um, last night after our first Easter service, I met a guy who last year at Easter gave his life to Christ. And he came up to me and he said, I just wanna mark this one year anniversary. <laughs> Thanks for leading me in that. And he said, uh, you know, God's been doing so much in my life in this past year. And I just wanna say to you, we are here to help you grow spiritually. If you stop at the Connect Center after service, there's a little booklet that, that's uh, written by Rick Warren. And it basically says, what on earth am I here for? And helps you learn to take some next steps of God's purpose for your life. And then some QR codes on a car that direct you to some tools that will help you. But we just wanna walk alongside you in any way we can and help you to grow. Okay, the team's gonna lead us in one final song and uh, then you'll be dismissed on this Easter day. God bless you. Have a wonderful holiday. Let's sing together. Put your hands together like this now. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus' resurrection one final time together.
back with the last minute. Well, hey, thanks so much for joining us this Easter weekend. We hope you enjoyed your time with us today. And I'm just so grateful for that message and just the perspective of heaven and the and the hope that we have in Jesus. I love that he is, did not stay dead. He rose from the grave and all of the implications that that has today in my life, that also has in your life, but also even in the life to come. I hope you walk into that week with that joy, hope, and perspective. Yeah, and if you made the decision to follow Jesus this weekend, first of all, we just wanna celebrate you. That is the best decision that you could ever make. Following Jesus completely changed my life and Kyler's life. We're just so happy for you. And we wanna get some resources into your hands so you can text 97,000, sorry, 2023 decision to 97,000, or you could fill out a connect card on our website or on the app. And we'd also love the opportunity to pray for you. And you can text your prayer request to please pray the number four, me to 97,000, or you can fill out a connect card on our website or in the app. Yeah. And lastly, if you want to give before you sign off here today, remember that everything that comes in is going towards our serve day giving project so that we can serve the area of Pittsburgh, but even go beyond that in our reach. And so you can give on our app or website, or you can text any dollar amount to the number 84321. And if this is one of your first time signing on, feel no pressure. But if you want to participate with our serve day giving project, you can. And thank you to everyone who's going to help make a difference in that way. But hey, that's going to be it for Allison and I. We hope wherever you're watching from, you enjoy the rest of your Easter weekend. I hope it is filled with lots of sunshine like it is today here. And uh, we will see you this time next week.